Well, thanks everybody. Um, great, to, great to be here today and great to be here in person. And let's hope we're going to have many more of these as we go into 2022. Um, I'd like to thank um, Hussain and Alan for um, inviting me here today. And I'd like to thank Hussain just then for thanking me for my speech in advance. It takes the pressure off if somebody thanks you for your speech in advance. So, 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 so thank you for that. Um, when, I, when I looked into you know, this event and to decide you know, what, to, what, what to speak about, it really sort of struck me how this summit brings together you know, designers, manufacturers, um, software, and microelectronics. And it really shows the unique position that TechWorks has in promoting and supporting UK's deep tech community. Um, and I know that, and I heard this from the comments just now, I know that tech, TechWorks shares the government's ambition to harness the UK's energy, energy, engineering and innovative technologies and to, make, and to make more of them. And that's a large part of what myself and my colleagues in Bayes, Bayes do. And in particular, to really develop and to grow the UK's position as a global technology superpower. And it's really that ambitious vision that I would like to speak to you about, about today. Now, we really are trying to ensure the UK's world-leading science and ideas turn into a world-leading solutions for, for public good. Now, in June, the Prime Minister announced the creation of a new National Science and Technology Council, which he's, which he's chairing himself, and a new Office for Science and Technology Strategy, which is under Sir Patrick Vallance. And both the Council and the Office, the intention is that they will provide strategic direction on the use of science, and importantly for this audience, on the use of technology, as tools to tackle great societal challenges and to help us level up and to boost, boost prosperity. And that's going to be so important going forward as we try to recover the economy from the ravages of the pandemic. Now, of course, we have all learned from our experience in dealing with the COVID pandemic. And look how it's made us all acutely aware of our reliance on global supply chains for critical products, materials, and components. And I have to say, that was a reliance that was, of course, exposed by the slowdown, but even more so, perhaps, by the rapid reopening of world economies as the pandemic started at least to fade. And let's hope it continues to fade after this, this present episode. But as we build back better, we need to better identify our strengths and our weaknesses, and frankly, to be honest about them. And the, what, are the, what are those areas where we can be world leading? And what are those areas where, frankly, we require a more strategic approach to our relationships with the global recovery? Now, you all know better than I do that the UK really does have significant deep tech strengths. But this will always remain a global industry where we will require access to global materials, technologies, and, and talent. And I'm really alive to, to that. And while that access can be strengthened by international relationships, I do believe that the, the key tool remains, remains trade itself. And it's going to be trade and the commercial opportunities that come from trade, I believe, is really going to, to drive this. Now, of course, that we've now left the, the EU. And what that's enabled us to do is to negotiate, to sign, and to ratify new trade agreements as an independent trading nation. Now, I'm sure all of you didn't pay much attention to to trade agreements in the past. But it's actually now our ambition to put the UK at a center of a global network of free trade agreements, but also free trade agreements which go massively beyond what we used to think of as trade agreements, you know, 
tariffs, movements of goods across, across boundaries, but to services, technology, you know, digitalization, and how can we use trade agreements to, to boost, boost deep tech in our technology um, industries. Um, and these trade deals, you know, the one we've done with Japan, the one we're negotiating at the moment with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which will bring, hopefully, Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam into our, audience, into our orbit. All these are designed to create opportunities for people and the companies in this room. Um, I really also feel that by increasing the geographical diversity of import supplies, we will benefit consumers and businesses through increased supply and choice. But of course, we equally have to grow our domestic strengths. In the four years since we published our industrial strategy, the UK's business and economic environment has almost changed beyond, beyond belief. And we've been presented with new challenges, but also new, new opportunities. Now, we've legislated to end our contribution to climate change, and we are forging a, a new path outside the EU and con as we continue to fight COVID-19. And really, we, we want, as we come back from the pandemic, you know, and in some ways it's a trite, a trite phrase until you really examine what it means, is to, is to build back better. And innovation, which will often be led by deep technology, is really central to that vision. And we do know from experience that innovations that have the most impact on society often result from not only technology advancement in isolation, but multiple technologies coming together at the same time. Which is why I think that you know, gatherings such as this are so important, and the synergies which come from gatherings like this. I mean, it would seem almost incredible that the indispensable smartphone, phone, if you think about it, brings together microprocessors with GPS, with cameras, with touchscreens, and 3 and 4G, and soon to be 5G technology. And it's that coming together, I think, which is really going to drive innovation going forward. Now, the innovation strategy that we published in July really set out our vision to make the UK a global hub for innovation by 2035. And it really seeks to boost private sector investment across the whole of the UK. And I stress that, the whole of the UK, creating the right conditions for businesses to innovate and giving them the confidence to, to do so. And the strategy sets out key actions to achieve our objectives, to stimulate innovation, to tackle global challenges, and drive capabilities in, in key technologies. And to focus attention on the potential of UK tech, we've identified seven key technology families which, which really feature UK strength and opportunity. And these families include many tech work strengths, advanced materials and manufacturing, AI, digital, and advanced computing, electronics, photonics, and quantum, and robotics and smart machinery. And we want innovators to be able to access the right private finance at the right stage, and for ourselves to provide targeted support where, we, where there are gaps. And something which I'm constantly trying to find our way through is, why is the UK so good at startups? Why can we fund series A, B, and C? Why do we fall behind the US when it comes to providing growth capital for our technology companies? And I came into this role you know, two years ago, not as a politician, but as a 
but as a, but as a business guy. And a lot of my life as an as a investment banker was spent trying to solve those value paradigms. But if we can make the UK a real home for growth capital, boy, is that going to benefit not just the businesses in this room, but importantly, those businesses which are coming on, coming on, coming on behind them. But of course, as part of all of this, we're also committed to build back greener. We held our Global Investment Summit um, just a few weeks ago in the, in, the, in the Science Museum. And it was a wonderful juxtaposition of the first industrial revolution, which of course was based entirely on coal and carbon, with the industrial revolution that we're now facing, which is based on the removal of coal and the removal of carbon. And the juxtaposition of those two things, I think, was a very nice illustration of the, the cycles that affect us all. And, uh, and I calculated we had something like $24 trillion of capital in the room that day. All that capital had come looking for opportunities to invest in in the UK. And as the UK's Minister for Investment, in a sense, the UK's salesman, you know, traveling around the world, trying to bring in finance to support companies, to support our ecosystems, that was absolutely kind of prime territory for, for me. Um, but I do think also that the, this whole green revolution gives a unique opportunity for UK tech to help shape and deliver the radical change taking place within our economy. Now, the Prime Minister has set out in his 10-point plan how we will seize these opportunities this new revolution will bring. 12 billion pounds of government investment pledged to support up to 250,000 green jobs. But governments can provide the billions that are needed but it's going to be the private sector that will have to provide the trillions that are needed. And being much more sophisticated as to how we can unlock private investment by using public investment is going to be the key to success in this. And again, one of my priorities at the moment is, if I look at our R&D budget, how can we open up our R&D budget, particularly in deep tech, to find ways of having private companies working alongside our public R&D and increasingly shift this to a, to a partnership, to a partnership culture. Part of the way that, I, that we're doing this is um, the, I lead the, our new office for investment, which operates out of 10 Downing Street, because it struck me early on into this role that to make the changes that we need to make in our centralized system in this country, you have to harness the power of the, of the center. And I use this office for investment to, to unblock sometimes these hidden barriers that seem to exist in our, in our bureaucracy, in our planning, you know, which are stopping people maximizing flows of, of, of investment. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that post-COVID, we have to refocus and redouble efforts to attract foreign investment. We are the most heavily foreign invested economy in the Western world. And this is not just a nice to have, it is a, an essential to have for our economy and frankly for our economic recovery as we come out of, out of COVID. Because foreign owned businesses or foreign invested businesses in the UK spend more money on research and development. They account for half of all our goods exports. They generate more IP. They are more productive. So it's an area where we shouldn't be scared of, 
of foreign investment, we should welcome it for really the whole range of advantages it brings to the British community. But of course, what I always couple that with is to say um, we mustn't be open for exploitation. We mustn't attract harmful investment. And that's why um, I was pleased to be part of our, of our new national security um, and investment processes that we're putting into, into, into place. And I was part of that to speak up for the role of investment and for the role of investors and the importance that companies such as those represented in the room have to have in terms of accessing, accessing capital. But I really do believe that what we have done with our, our, our new regime is that by course we've strengthened our existing powers, but we have made it much, much more specific, right down to the granular level about how those powers will be, will be used. And in conversations with investors, I'm confident that instead of having a, a chilling effect on investment, it will actually give proper signposts to investors to know where they can invest and how we will welcome that investment. Another one of my responsibilities in, 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 in government is that I'm responsible for the automotive sector. And I was very interested to see that the work that TechWorks is doing in the whole automotive electronic systems innovation network. And I really believe that the opportunities here for the UK are fantastic. We are at the beginning of an automotive renaissance. A point in history that's going to be remembered as the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel generating car and the changes of magnitude we've never, never seen before. And by 2030, we estimate that the electric vehicle transition will create an additional 30,000 manufacturing jobs in the UK, rising to, to 60,000 by, by, by 2050. And of course, I'm absolutely aware of the importance of electronics in automotive manufacturing going forward, a point that was referred to, referred to earlier. And it's been very, very satisfying to have been deeply involved in Nissan's in, um, in investment intention to invest in the plant in Sunderland. And what a great thing that Nissan last week, when they announced their, their, their total EV strategy, identified the UK as their main center outside Japan for the development of electronic vehicles. And if we can capitalize on that, Think of the benefit that it will bring, not just to the communities there, but to the people in this room. I was delighted to negotiate new investments by Ford, new investments by Stellantis. And why I call it the auto renaissance, I believe that there is a, a wave there, which if we can surf it, will transform the automotive sector in the UK and really re-establish us as one of the main automotive manufacturing countries in the world. And that would have seemed a, an impossible statement to make even just two or three years ago. So, look, to conclude, I really feel that there are great opportunities for the, for the deep tech sector. To develop UK technologies, to reap the rewards of our net zero ambition, to help us capture key inward investment, which as I've said, we so surely need, and also to use our emerging new trading relationships and regulatory frameworks to bring the best and create the best in the, in the UK. So I hope the event goes, goes, goes well today, and I can speak for the whole of government, and in particular my colleagues in the trade department, in the business department, and number 10, where I've got no doubt that if we can harness the energy in this room, 
if we can harness deep tech, there's going to be a bright future, not just for this sector, but for the whole of the UK. Thank you all very much. <laughs>